hello there and welcome to this video number one of conservation paleobiology. Um, since I'm just reeling from the fact that this is now on to session number seven of this course, I actually went back and I just watched the first videos that I recorded in my introduction back in July for all of you. And I'm pleased to report that I'm doing all of the things that I said I would. I also noted I, that I think my ability to record good sound has improved since that point. And I can't help but notice that I've aged over the intervening few months. So there you go. Uh, that was an insight that um, is going to be staying with me for a while. So on that cheerful note, let's have a look at another cheerful thing. Let's introduce conservation paleobiology. Now, as I'm sure you're aware, humans are having a significant effect on the biosphere of the earth. Our cities, our fossil fuel emissions and associated climate change, all of our agricultural activities, all of these, um, which I've chosen to represent with these really fantastic uh, Valletti paintings, which you can see in the Manchester Art Gallery, if you ever fancy it. Um, all of these things are impacting on natural ecosystems. Manchester city centre is a very long way from the natural state of the world. So let's start by setting some context. As I stressed in our lecture on extinction, um, you may remember the uh, Gustave Dore uh, cover slide that I used for that, big fan of Gustave Dore. Um, there is, I think, strong evidence that humans are having a significant impact on the biosphere. Many people characterize this as the sixth mass extinction. And based on our Zoom session, this is a viewpoint that the majority of your, you um, appeared to share with me. So this situation is the reason why conservation science is necessary. I put a, a definition on this slide. So conservation is the plan of protection, maintenance, management, sustainable use, and restoration of natural resources in the environment in order to secure their long-term survival. Traditionally, this is a science that has been couched in the present and on ecological timescales. So just looking at the, um, the timescales that are observable in terms of human history, trying to understand how to overcome human impacts based on the changes that these are bringing about today. But I wanted to highlight to start this lecture that paleo conservation paleobiology, sorry, I should say, is a contrast to this because it takes a longer term view that can help inform and support these efforts. So these aren't in competition, they're highly complementary. The best definition I could find for conservation paleobiology is that it is an, an emerging field that uses geohistorical data to meet these challenges by developing and testing models of how biota respond to environmental stresses. So this is from the, uh, the paper that I have cited here. But long story short, conservation paleobiology is conservation, but using fossils and paleoecology to provide this long term view um, to help inform ecology. I note that in contrast to the majority of the things that I've covered in this lecture, this really is a very new field. I wouldn't have been giving this lecture um, even 10 years ago because all of these studies were this kind of disparate diaspora of interesting scientific studies that have only recently been brought together and recognized as a field of conservation paleobiology. Um, and I think that will be reflected in the nature of these videos. I, I will rely on a lot, lot more kind of individual paper studies um, saying, well, this paper did that, um, rather than trying to write general rules, because we don't have that feeling of a, a general state of the field really yet in many areas. But it also makes it in a really exciting field, so I hope you'll agree with me that this is the case. So why do we need conservation paleobiology? Well, to demonstrate this, to, to kind of make a case for conservation paleobiology, let's think about the current state of play, the effects that human intervention um, have had over the historical period on the Earth's surface. So if we look at this graph in the middle here, we can see that more than half of the Earth's ice-free land mass um, is now taken up with uh, landscapes and ecosystems that have been modified by humans. If we want a real example of this that's incredibly close to home, most of the UK uh, was originally a temperate rainforest such as that that was shown on the left-hand side here. This is the typical ecosystem that the UK um, had, the, the islands that we live on um, had prior to human intervention. 
This means that all of those idyllic country scenes are the kind you see in adverts for like wholemeal bread, for example, with sheep and fields and lots and lots of dry stone walls. All of those are hum heavily human modified ecosystems. And indeed, looking around the UK now, we can say that there are hardly any unaltered ecosystems that survive on our island. Those that do are, for example, um, just small air patches up in the north of Scotland. So conservation science and um, associated disciplines try to manage ecosystems and maintain biodiversity. But they also um, have to try and support the processes that support resilience and allow adaptation to ongoing climate change and the new pressures inherent to the Anthropocene. So we can take this view where the environment is changing rapidly um, and all of the systems, be they um, biological or human, and conservation biology itself, are having to fast adapt to this respond to this um, emerging environmental challenge. Those two points bring us to something of a paradox, right? So we're seeking to preserve a system, but it's a system that we know is ever changing. So conservation goals will, by necessity, be moving targets. Yeah. So this dude I've shown on the right here is a guy called Heraclitus, a Greek philosopher who's famous for the observation, to paraphrase, that, the, that change is the only constant. So if we recognise this in conservation biology, so uh, ecosystems are always changing, we therefore need to understand how that change occurs over timescales of decades, centuries and millennia allowing us to focus our efforts on maintaining processes functioning and resilience of our ecosystems rather than um, really tying what we're doing into particular ecosystem states or particular target sizes. Basically what I'm saying is we have to fit all of this into the context that everything is changing and the fossil record and conservation paleobiology is the only way in which we can provide that deep time context that we need to be able to do this. So more broadly, we can talk about these historical records as the geohistorical record. It's a, a phrase I've used in passing um, in my definition of the, um, of the field. Just bear in mind that that means basically paleobiological and paleoecological records. So I realised that that's quite an um, abstract example, I guess. And so I wanted to now provide a, <coughs> a more concrete example of how conservation paleobiology can help us to maintain processes and the functioning of ecosystems. So as that example, we can't achieve that aim of protecting the uh, processes and therefore the functioning of ecosystems by just fencing off protected areas into, for example, nature reserves. It is a reality that the current rate of global warming is faster than pretty much any extant species has experienced over the course of that species existence. And because of this, fences won't work because if nature reserve boundaries are strictly delineated and they're not porous, things can't move through them, species found within the reserves can't successfully move to track changes in climate. For example, as climate warms, um, species ranges tend to move um, to higher latitudes to track the temperature in which that community is uh, best suited. That was poor English, but you get what I'm saying, right? So to successfully conserve modern ecosystems, we have to create suitable corridors or stepping stones which will allow communities to move. So you can see some examples of how these may work um, on the right hand side here. So these are some um, ways in which uh, we can have nature reserves which are joined up by different structures allowing um, animal communities to move with changing climates. And that's in contradistinction to the approach that's been used in this South African nature reserve on the left where, um, where areas have just been fenced off. Ultimately this won't help protect those communities if the ch temperature change is too high. In extreme cases, we may also have to think about translocations. We may actually have to think about moving whole populations to other regions where they will be more able to survive.
If we're thinking of these strategies, either linking up our nature reserves or actually translocating populations, paleoecology and the fossil record can provide some key evidence-based projections um, on several um, different topics which can help us plan this work. So by looking at the fossil record and by paleo using paleoecological studies, we can look at how species and communities in current nature reserves are likely to react to predicted levels of climate change. This can be in terms of migrations, in terms of their range shifts, and in terms of localized extinctions. All of that you can get from the fossil record and then apply to modern day ecosystems. The fossil record can also tell us which species might be expected to naturally migrate as a result of climate change and the effects that such migrations are likely to have on the ecosystems of which they are a part. The fossil record can also tell us what combination of species may be suitable for translocations beyond their historical ranges, so allowing us to introduce these to completely new regions in order to ensure their survival. Furthermore, the fossil record can tell us how ecosystems might be expected to react to translocations if we were to undertake that step. So that's four areas that the fossil record can be really, really valuable in terms of helping us to plan um, modern day conservation. And I've got lots and lots of other examples throughout the course of this lecture of these four videos that will hopefully help illustrate that further. I wanted to finish this particular video just by highlighting that conservation paleobiology covers all kinds of time ranges, but it's most easy for our purposes, I think, to split it into two general camps. The first one, which I'll focus on, on this particular slide is kind of a near time approach. This uses a relatively young fossil record, primarily from, primarily from the far past two million years. So we're talking about Pleistocene ecosystems, such as the one that you can see in this image here. As someone that works on things older than 300 million years old, often older than a billion years old, um, I would basically call this topsoil, but that doesn't mean that it's not useful. That's just me. Um, saying things to get a rise out of my fellow paleontologists. And I suppose I'm now doing this on a public video, so that was unwise. But nevertheless, let's carry on. Let's pretend I didn't say that. So in this kind of near time uh, approach, um, we can use the geohistorical record, this kind of paleoecological, paleobiological record to provide context for present day conditions, focusing largely on extant species. So this gives us the context for what's happening today. And by doing that, we can achieve a number of aims that we may deeply care about. So for example, using the fossil record, we can define baselines in which we can compare conditions before and after disturbance, especially disturbance caused by humans. We can use the fossil record to examine the responses of species and ecosystems to recent natural and also anthropogenic, so human caused perturbations. So we can both um, create a baseline for these and compare the impact that we they have. We can also provide the context for changes by showing a historical range of variability. Is, for example, the level of change that we're seeing today really outside that that we might expect from, um, from the, looking at the deeper time perspective of the history of Earth? All of that lets us set realistic targets for restoration. It lets us differentiate between um, what we may expect in terms of non-human caused change and human caused change. So we can differentiate those, those two. And they, this kind of approach also allows us to recognize factors that can be explained only by events or conditions that are not present in the system today. So there could have been some event, um, say a few th tens of thousands of years ago, that is no longer occurring, um, but will explain some of the observations that we may be w making. So that could be very, very useful. So uh, my example to illustrate this is that of the mammoth extinction. And I think this is a great example of um, how we can use the fossil record to tell us about the response of a species to anthropogenic forcing. The paper that I cited here by Nuges Bravo et al in 2008 uh, um, suggests that mammoths went extinct because in the most recent interglacial period, mammoths had a catastrophic loss of the habitats in which they lived. As the last glaciers retreated and the planet warmed, 90% of these animals um, 
former habitats disappeared. So we were left with tiny refugia, these kind of like um, places where they're still holding out across Eurasia and tiny patches um, of populations that were still squeezed up against the northern coastal edges of continents. But we also know, looking at the fossil record, that mammoths have survived similarly extreme interglacials and the bottlenecks that we associate with those in the past before this last one. So the key question then is, why did this last one kill off the mammoths, which we can only tell from the fossil record, as opposed to the ones before that point? And this paper makes the case that it's because this situation of these, um, these, this bottleneck was then compounded by human hunting. The paper actually models the impact of human hunting and shows that even with the most optimistic estimates of both mammoth population size and density, if each human killed just one mammoth every three years, the species would go extinct. And under more pessimistic estimates of populations, um, this paper estimated that the loss of as few as one mammoth every 200 years per human in its territory might have driven this group to extinction. So whilst in this example, there is some uncertainty remaining, this paper, I think, makes a strong suggestion that humans and human impacts are ultimately responsible for exacerbating this bottleneck and then driving this group to extinction. So that's an insight of how the near-term fossil record can understand, for example, species dynamics. And for the last slide of this particular video, I wanted to contrast that near-time approach with the deeper time approach. So this is the approach in which we analyze biotic responses to system perturbations of a diverse range of um, kinds and magnitudes. So in essence, what I'm talking about is using the much older geological record as an archive, um, which we can view as repeated natural experiments from which we can learn. And then we can apply that knowledge to modern day conservation efforts. So some of these events in the past may well approximate present day disturbances, or indeed those that we predict for the near future based on the realities of anthropogenic climate change. Um, so we know that events have occurred in the past in which substantial warm climate warming occurred, and we'll be meeting one of those um, later in this lecture. Uh, and that was coupled um, in this event that I will introduce with ocean acidification of the same kind that we're expecting in the future as a, a, a result of our activities. But also, this allows us to um, this approach allows us to test biotic responses under a broader array of conditions than is available in the modern world or indeed the recent past. And that's valuable because consistent patterns involving now extinct species at remote periods of time in the past can strengthen the kind of the ecological theory, our theoretical knowledge that under, underlies all conservation practice today. So we're kind of, it's helping us to understand the bread and butter of ecological topics that are important for conservation. As an example, we could go back to our picture of carbon, carboniferous rainforest collapse that I covered, I think in the paleoecology lecture. So, it, that example could alternatively have been included in today's lecture because it showed the response of an organism to environmental forcing. Um, so if we, we remind ourselves of that example, we had increasing aridification across the Carboniferous to Permian boundary um, with a fragmentation of habitats that happened as a result. Um, and this showed um, species richness both decreasing across that boundary and then gradually recovering as we go into the Permian period. But it also showed that rather than animal communities becoming less fractured and less widespread, they became more widespread, perhaps because there are fewer barriers there. So here we can say in this example, a major global perturbation led to communities being better connected, but with a lower global diversity. And if that's a general pattern, and we can reveal it by doing further studies and really uh, cement that knowledge, we can then start to make predictions as humans create a similar or comparable um, situation uh, in terms of global um, biodiversity um, patterns today. So I think that this deep time approach is also really, really valuable. 
So with that, that's an introduction to conservation paleobiology, and I will see you for video number two, where we'll be looking at some kind of examples where the deep time perspective that the fossils can give are really, really valuable and can overturn the expectations that we would otherwise have by looking at just uh, living ecosystems. So I'll see you there in a second.